Welcome to Library Land Conversations. I'm Greg Pervolcanti, the Executive Director of the Library Land Project. Welcome. I'm Adam Zand, the President of the Library Land Project. We're here for another installment of Library Land Conversations. These started as ways for us to keep uh, up to date on what's happening in the library land, especially during the pandemic, but they've really expanded as a great way to learn from people in the wider library community. Right on, Adam. Today, we're straying a little bit from the public library path, but it's totally worth it. We're speaking with Michelle Chesner, the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies at Columbia University, the Vice President slash President-elect for the Association of Jewish Libraries, and perhaps most importantly for our purposes, the co-director of Footprints, a project that follows Jewish books through time and place. We were introduced to Michelle and her work by my University of Alabama classmate, Yam Jupiter Levin. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for having me. So nice to be here. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. Looking forward to this one, especially. So as Greg mentions on a, on a recent library land conversation, uh, we learned about the AJL and the mapping project that Yam and, and Neil Frau Cortez are working on. So we're excited to share your work with Footprints. Thank we, you. We, we spent time exploring Footprints, but can you share sort of the basic details of the project? What's it all about? Absolutely. Um, so Footprints came out of the idea that books are uh, early, early modern printed books, um, that is, and we work with books printed from the inception of movable, movable type in the West, so, you know, 1450 or so, um, through the year 1800. And these books contain what we're thinking of as somewhat of a hidden archive of uh, for for Jewish books for Jewish people, um, and the reason for that is that books are bought, sold, annotated, uh, censored, burned, uh, stolen, <laughs> gifted, um, and often the traces of all of those encounters are recorded in the books themselves. And so we've we've what we do with the in footprints is that we are recording all of those traces in what we call footprints because it's a it's like a step. Uh, in the path of this particular book, and we see the footprints that it has left behind. So that's sort of the basic premise of the project. That's exciting. So it, it really does fit into the tradition of passing on knowledge through text and commentary in, in, in a huge way. That's, that's awesome. So take us back. What was the genesis of the project and why is it at Columbia and all those kind of good things? Sure. So it actually started as a working group on the history of the Jewish book at the Center for Jewish History. The working group was started by Adam Shear, and then uh, Marjorie Lehman joined as a as a convener, as did Josh Toplitsky, and those are my three co-directors on the project. Um, and when the when the two year term of the working group was completed, the academic advisor um, at the time, Judith Siegel turned to the conveners and said, well, very nice that you all have had uh, academic conversations about the history of the Jewish book. Um, how are you going to make this practical? Have you learned anything that you can turn into, uh, you know, something real, something, something tangible? Um, which I think is not a question that is often asked in academic research projects, you do the research, you write the paper, you publish the book, um, you don't have to, you don't have to sort of take it further than publishing your research, which of course is, is the point. Um, and I think Judith pushing them in that way uh, was really incredible because it meant they had to think in a, in sort of a different way. Um, and so what they realized is that one of the key um, desiderata in the field of the study of the Jewish book. There's been a lot done on, um, you know, texts, a lot done on the history of printing, but not so much on reception. Uh, that being said, the data is there. So my colleague, Adam, for instance, has wrote a book on the reception history of a particular book called the Kuzari. Um, and he said if he had had access to all of these volumes of this particular text when he was writing this book, 
it, it would have been an entirely different book because understanding the uses and the the ways in which people use the book sometimes that they included in their text and again and and it's important to note that Jewish books are not only read by Jews um, there's a there's a long um, history of, of Christian Hebraism. So, you know, Christian scholars who are studying Hebrew texts, not all Hebrew books are Jewish specifically. One of the earliest printed book is a Hebrew copy of Avicenna's Canon for Hebrew, for Jewish doctors who would have needed access to this medical encyclopedia. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, ways to slice it, but ultimately we wanted to try and capture all of this data. Um, and uh, that, so I joined the project at that point. Um, they presented to the working group. My three co-directors are all faculty, uh, two in history, uh, sorry, history, religion, and Talmud. Um, and I'm the librarian. Um, so if you're doing a book project, you generally need to talk about metadata and things like standards. And I came in and I said, well, how are you, how are you breaking it down? What are your, what are your standards uh, for cataloging these books? And they said, well, could you, could you maybe join our project? Um, and so I, I then came on, on the project. Um, it was initially built uh, by what was then the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning at Columbia, um, because my colleague Marjorie Lehman, who's a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, had a class that she she um, created to uh, to to do just this, to see the materiality of texts and what what you can learn about looking at the books themselves. Um, and our Center for Teaching and Learning also has a designated person who works for the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary faculty um, because they're down the block, they're six blocks up from us. And so we have a lot of partnerships. And so once she started that class, uh, we worked very closely with what's now the Center for Teaching and Learning at Columbia, and they built this incredible site for us um, and have been doing just wonderful work uh, throughout to help us get it up and running and, you know, all the all the nitty gritty back end, um, which is so critical. That's awesome. That's awesome. It, you know, it's, it's really funny. I'm in the middle of a metadata class and a digital libraries class. And so I really enjoyed seeing kind of the information that you were including with 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 each item and with each footprint. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided what data to present? Sure. Um, so this was a key piece. So we, we actually have a hierarchical structure. Um, so it's sort of Ferber, um, but slightly, um, slightly edited because you don't have uh, different editions um, you have the publication and just the year of publication because we're working in a pre-modern era. Um, so the top level is the literary work, which is just the author and title. So the work exists in um, abstraction. And then you come into the imprint, which is the, uh, you know, place and date at which a book is produced on a press. Um, and for that, we have relatively minimal information um, that's required to create an imprint because there's an incredible resource out of the National Library of Israel called the Bibliography of the Hebrew Book. Um, and so what we've done is we link to the Bibliography of the Hebrew Book in our imprint uh, section because that has all the information about the print information. We are not trying to duplicate a union catalog of all Hebrew yeah. print. That has been done. Um, and ultimately, you know, down the road, we'd love to link with them more closely. Um, but we have as a one of our standard identifier is a what we call a BHB number. So that's the system number for the Bibliography of the Hebrew Book. And you can actually click the link in the footprints record to get to that record if you want to know more about the printing of that particular book. So the base, so we just ask for the basics, you know, uh, where it's printed, when it's printed, uh, uh, a title, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. You can add all sorts of their fields to add additional information for the imprint, um, but the key information is really just uh, title as on the book and then date and place. Then we have a copy um, because lots of things happen to a particular copy. So, you know, the books come off the press, we're taking one of those books, um, and then we have each copy could have multiple footprints and a footprint is that moment at which something happens to a book. So the footprint could be that in 1597, Domenico Yerzeli-Mitano reviewed the book. He was, a, he was an expurgator, he was a censor, um, and he signed the book as having reviewed it in say Mantua, and I'm, that could be wrong. I can't remember where he was in 1597. <laughs> um, 
but in that place. And actually, I should say censors are fabulous. I mean, they're terrible, but also they're fabulous because no the church <laughs> the church censors were so good at keeping records. So we might not know who owned it in Mantua in 1597, <laughs> but because they were so careful, we know that it was owned in Mantua in 1597. So there's actually a lot of information that we get from the censors, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's like the data exhaust of the, uh, of the yeah, right. modern world. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's great. You've given us a, an overview of the structure and, and the metadata behind it all. So who's using the collection and, and how are they using it? So it's it's all it's coming from all different kinds of, of places. We now have about 17,000 records um, and the records are from all over the place. So uh, we've worked with libraries around the world. We have scholars who are uh, who have their own collections, who are entering data from their collections into, into this database. Um, so both private and, and more openly accessible collections. Um, we work with historic collections. So we'll look at an auction catalog from 1912 um, and put that data in. So even if we don't know where those books went, we know that in 1912, there was a copy of the Canon printed in Naples in um, 1492. You know that was sold in Munich in 1412, um, which which gives us a uh, information about something even if it it does not exist anymore. Um, and sometimes we find matches. So, for instance, this this um, catalog from 1912, uh, it was of Incunabula, so of the earliest printed books, uh, the books printed before 1501. Um, it was specifically a catalog of Hebrew and Canabula. Um, and one of them was, it was a multi-volume work that was slightly damaged. So it was very clear what the work was. And we actually found where that copy is today. It's at the Huntington uh -huh. because it's only volume two and the Huntington marked it as, you know, the very specific, um, the copy specific uh, information matched. So we, we also have those kinds of discoveries, which are really exciting. Um, and then, which doesn't answer your user question. So the people who then use, that's just getting the data into the site and getting the data into the site is a scholarly work in itself because there's a lot of research that goes into it. Um, there, it, it, it takes a lot of work to do that, just that piece. You need to know paleography. You have to read Hebrew scripts of, from all over the world um, and, and across you know, 500 or so years. Um, but then on the user, the user end, um, uh, what we, the way we think about it is that it's a way that you can look either at the micro levels, so sort of reconstructing libraries that have been scattered, and there are many of those, you can put them back together because if you have, you know, owner A, his library went to five different people for different collections, they're now sort of digitally reconnected in footprints, or you can look at it from a macro level. So if you're interested in who was studying, um, you know, Jewish law in Berlin in uh, 1792, you can look at just where what footprints were in Berlin in the late 18th century. So it goes it goes sort of from the very large to the very small. Um, and and we recognize that, you know, we're just producing this data and the questions that will be asked on the data or that will be generated from the data, um, are, we might not even have thought of them yet, which is kind of amazing. Um, we, we recently started tracking um, gender where it's indicated. So we have indications of women owning books and annotating books, um, you know, things like that. So, so there are all sorts of different sort of permutations of how somebody could approach this, this material. But our goal is to bring it all together digitally in a way that then you can put some questions in and see what was going on um, at a particular time or even map it across time. So um, one example that we've looked at, so um, thinking of Incunabula, these, these early super special books, um, looking at their movement across 500 years. So we have, a, we have this, this um, section called the Path Mapper um, where you can map the paths based on yeah. a specific data set. Um, and we, if you put in uh, books printed before 1501, you can see both a timeline of when these books moved and then also a map of where they moved. So you can see when, um, you know, a lot of stuff happened in the late 18th, early 19th century, but 
there's also a tremendous amount that happened before that. Um, so as far as understanding, you know, the building of Judaica collections in the U.S. Uh, prior to World War II, which is sort of this watershed moment, which when a lot of stuff changes, um, you know, a lot of a lot of different. Uh, there are just so many different ways to to come at that data. That's that's really helpful and, and very awesome. Uh, can you share? I mean, you, you've kind of mentioned a few footprints. Are there a few that that you have found especially striking or really interesting that you could you could describe? Sure. Um, so one that I always love to to mention is um, we put in the data from um, Audrey Offenberg had a list of incunabula that were missing from libraries in Europe. Um, after World War II. So either they had been confiscated by the Nazis or the or the libraries had been bombed or, you know, these were cunabula that had been known to be in collections and now were missing. Um, and at the same time, um, we had also been, we, we spent a couple of years working specifically on incunabula. So our data set there is, is very, very comprehensive. Um, and we found, we actually found one of those missing books um, because we had entered uh, an incunabula collection from uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary. They have the largest collection of Hebrew incunabula in the world. So there was a lot there to enter. Um, and then we saw that the record matched. Again, it had, it was from the uh, rabbinical Sem seminary in Breslau and it had the stamp from the seminary and the descriptions matched. And we could say, okay, well, now we've found, this is no longer a missing book. This is a found book. So that sort of thing to me is, is just really exciting. Um, if I may just mention my very favorite uh, book that's in the system. Please. It's um, it's a pity this is audio and I can't show it to you, but the ins there's it's a book uh, printed in the late 16th century, if I recall correctly. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and there's an 18th century inscription that says, um, I bought this book, I think in 1781, something like that. Um, it was printed 181 years ago is the inscription in Yiddish. So the owner oh. of this book in the 18th century, in the 1700s is saying, oh my goodness, this book is so old. It was printed <laughs> so long ago. You know, and of course we're looking at it 300 years later, not 300, 250 years later. And we think it's old too, but it's even older. <laughs> Actually, you know, so, we, we are recording video. So do, do you have it? Should I? Yeah, let me see if I can, if I can bring it up. Um, it'll take me a couple of minutes. I don't um, want the sharing screen, but oh, we, yeah. we could um we could put a yeah. picture of it. Yeah, if, if you like, have a photo. If we can yeah. edit it or we can put it on our social media when we're Yeah, I could certainly it. I could certainly send I, you that. Like, I, I have a I have a follow-up. Um and it, yeah. it, 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 it it's kind of troubling in a way. Are there records uh kept of books that were hidden in the camps and maybe the Warsaw ghetto? Um, so we're finding, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of the, um, what's known as the paper brigade in the Warsaw ghetto. So they, oh, definitely. Um, yep. yeah, so they, they hid these books, um, and yep. brought them into the ghetto and put them in, um, many of those books ended up at YIVO, um, the, the Institute for Yiddish Culture, um, in Manhattan. And so those books, I'm not sure if they're in our database yet, um, but we're, we've worked with a number of YIVO books. We have, for instance, the um, books from the Streshun Library, which are now at YIVO. So this was a public community library in Vilna um, that that was that was confiscated by the Nazis and then and then was taken and then ended up um, coming coming to YIVO in the United States. So we have those we have those books and part of their footprints are, you know, they're in the Strasheln Library. They're held um, at the Offenbach Depot, which is where all of these books were sort of gathered. Um, and then now they're in New York at YIVO. So we do have a number of books that that go through sort of that process of um, had been had been taken and then sort of returned um, in in whatever way. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, we have a number of books from the, the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Project, which was the project following World War II when the um, U.S. Army came upon this depot with millions of books and tried to figure out what they should do with them. Um, and a number of them went to either Jewish cultural institutions, some went to uh, universities, some went to um, yeshivot, Jewish, Jewish seminaries. Um, and so we have a, a quite a few records for those in our system as well. So tra tracing those um, that that those interactions as well, um, definitely. 
Yeah. How about how about the camps, or is that just too hard to tell? Um, you know, a notation that might have taken place during the the holidays or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy to have books in the camp, so they might not have marked it up. I mean, we can only yeah. we can only not that I so the the easy answer is no, that I not that I know of. Um, yeah. But there, you know, it's very possible that there's something there. We just don't know. Um, yet. I mean, we, it, we're we working from a number of different sources. So the, the ideal source, of course, is the book itself, because then you can look at everything about it. And, you know, sometimes the binding will have a stamp of an owner, and sometimes the inner flyleaf will have a stamp of the owner, um, or some some kind of information about it. Um, we have, we do have some with Nazi stamps on them. So clearly, hmm. they had been uh, taken to be part of that Reich Institute for the study of the Jewish people. Um, so we have a couple like that, um, a few like that, but uh, but we only can see the traces that were left. And so we're very yep. aware that, you know, we might have something in the 16th century and then something in the 19th century, and obviously something happened to it in between, but we have no way, you know, I tell people, you, you should write in your book, as long as they're your books, write in your books. <laughs> <laughs> because, wow. because, because just let people know, you know, one day. <laughs> People. So just to reiterate, censors are fabulous and write in your book. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here I am. I'm going to lose my library degree. It's going to get ripped up. <laughs> so I, 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 I guess, I mean, you're sort of leading into um, what do you think the impact on teaching and learning is with this whole project? Um, so it's been wonderful. I mean, part of part of the fact that it's been it was created by the Center for Teaching and Learning. We have a section on uh, pedagogy on our site, and it's been used in multiple classes in in different kinds of ways. Um, so the first class that Marjorie did, they the students actually worked on uh, they worked in the JTS collection, which is an amazing collection, and they each got to take a book and look at it and and try track the individual story of that book. Um, and then for their final paper, they had to do something reflective. So a student wrote, um, created a book of her own that told her story. So the students actually engaged with it in so many different ways, which is really interesting. Um, we've used it, all of, all of my co-directors have used it in various classes. Um, most recently I used it in, um, in a class on the history of the Jewish book. So obviously um, it sort of makes sense. We had a, we had a class session on um, the movement we had on, on uh, like book selling and how books get from one place to another. Um, and that was the perfect example, obviously. Um, so we were able to show the students, you know, one of the things I always say is that just because a book is printed, if you have two printed books, um, they they tell from the two early printed books, I should, and I mean, it, it could work in the modern era too, but they tell totally different stories. So you can have two, you know, a, a giant book and a smaller book, both came off the same press. It's just that one, when it was bound, was bound, was cut very, very close to the margins. And one was bound in a more luxurious copy. And then you have one with annotations or one with a vellum binding and one that's rebound in the 20th century. You know, so, so each of those, everything that happens to that book then is a piece of that story. So we're trying to gather all of these little remnants that tell pieces of the story and putting them into this database that will hopefully reveal a larger picture. It's like we're taking, you know, millions of puzzle pieces and we're trying to, we're trying to show like just a little piece of the sky over there. Um, and some of it is actually appearing, which is, which is really amazing. It is amazing. Oh, I'll say. It is amazing. Um, so I, I know um, people are probably wondering at this point, how can they participate and get involved? Yeah, what's the crowdsource element of this? Because I know that something that's been discussed. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll answer both of that. Um, so the website is uh, footprints.ctl.columbia.edu. Um, you could email us at footprints at columbia.edu, and that'll go uh, to the four of us. Um, we have so so there are a couple of different levels of involvement. We've worked with librarians who've who've given us like an export of their data of books, of, of Jewish books. Usually it's just, they just stick with Hebrew because that's a filter that you can do easily. Um, printed between, you know, until 1800. And they printed books, not manuscripts. And I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, and they can just export the data, send us a spreadsheet and we can clean it up to fit our requirements and import, you know, 500 records at a time. And that's lovely. The other way to do it is we have researchers who sit in libraries. So we're doing research on any, um, 
any um, topic um, and they come across an inscription and they either email it to us or they have a direct login to the site and they put it in directly. Um, my colleague Josh Deplitsky wrote a wonderful blog post. Um, also, it's available through the through the Footprint site called Don't Kill Your Darlings. Um, how Footprints is helping me finish my next book, something like that. Um, because he said he kept coming across really interesting things um, that he wanted to incorporate into his book, but he realized it didn't wasn't relevant to his book, but he could put it into Footprints so that information was not lost. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah. Um, we're, kind of, we're coming up on time. A couple of final questions for you. Are, are there some other things that you're involved with that you'd like to share? Ah, uh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> I sort of touch a lot of different things. Um, What's on your to-do list? Yeah, uh, exactly. How long is my to-do list? Um, <laughs> the so I'm working on. Uh, we have an exhibit uh, for the first time, a joint exhibit with the Jewish Theological Seminary on the Jews of Corfu. Um, Columbia's collection is is of Judaica manuscripts is the third largest in the country and. JTS's collection is the largest in the country and one of the largest in the world. Um, but between the two of us, we have the largest collection of materials um, relating to this small community um, on the Greek island of Corfu, um, which is a very interesting community in all sorts of ways. They produced incredible art and uh, they were there was an Italian section and a native sort of Greek section and then all sorts of people who sort of stopped in on their way to the Ottoman Empire because that was a place where lots of Jews were traveling to in the early modern period because of um, freer religious um, opportunities. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited for that to go up. That's going to be both physically um, at Columbia and at JTS. So, and it'll be this, this combined exhibit. It was supposed to go up last spring, but of yeah. course, um, lots of things were supposed to happen yeah. last spring and didn't. Um, so I'm very excited about that. That's been a tremendous amount of work, but really, really gratifying. Um, so I'm excited. I'm really excited for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, lots of lots of just little things that I that I've I've been working on, but <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. That's great. So we'll we'll pivot with a, our traditional way we end these. I, I, I'm guessing you're a library traveler. Do you have any favorite libraries you'd like to share with us, or a, a library memory, maybe from your youth, or both? <laughs> Sure. Um, so actually, it's a footprints related one. Um, one of our first uh, grants that we got was to work with the Marshes Library in Dublin, um, which had um, because the um, Archbishop March Marsh was very interested in Hebrew and he collected, he had about 200 Hebrew books. Um, and we were able to hire somebody to catalog their Hebrew books and also their footprints. Um, and that library, I don't know if either of you have ever been there, but it is, no. it is a time it. Yep. capsule of an 18th century library. And it is so breathtaking. Um, you know, the, the, the shelves are exactly out there as they were. They actually have cages where they lock the, uh, like where they lock the readers in so that they wouldn't steal anything. Um, not oh, sure gosh. I recommend that, but, um, but it's really just such a lovely place to be. Um, and the people who are there are also fantastic, which is a bonus. Um, but that was, that was definitely on, on my top 10. Um, growing up, I grew up in Baltimore. So shout out to the Baltimore County Public Library, where I spent many, many, many days and months <laughs> reading through all of their stuff. <laughs> That's great. So. That's awesome. Um, well, Michelle, it has been just an absolute pleasure. It, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing the project. Thank you for the work you're doing for uh, for the collection and for the practice of librarianship. It's it's really so heartening. Thank to you see. so much. It's it's really it, such a joy to do this. Yeah, this this was uh this was great. Um and yeah, thank you. Like I said originally, that this is part of the tradition, the passing on of knowledge and commentary, importantly. And yeah. I think Footprints fits in with that so well. So friends, this one's coming to an end, but there's lots of library land conversations on deck. You can even go back um, on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube and see some past episodes. And we're gonna share more. Uh, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, especially suggestions on guests, uh, drop us a line at info at librarylandproject.org. And until next time, we will see you in Libraryland. Library Land.